ba 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 St. Elsewhere, of course. Who wanted to be on staff at St. Elsewhere? How many of you were heroes like that, huh? I vaguely remember the cast. I remember the cast by face. But, of course, it had some fantastic actors in there. William Daniels was in there. A lot of great, it was sort of the precursor to a lot of the really modern hospital shows. We kick off the uh, 2013 Transform Conference morning session with our latest theme, St. Elsewhere. I'm glad you guys guessed it. We had a little trouble last night with Chicago Hope, a slightly more obscure show. Uh, and then, of course, Doogie Howser in the afternoon because we did interview some sixth grade scientists who, I have to say, I'm feeling very old this morning. That's for sure. For those of you who are at that session, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Anyway, welcome. We are here at the most important sort of gathering of civic culture in America. I think that's going on right now, far more important than the debate being taken place uh, in, in, on Capitol Hill regarding America's foreign policy. If you can address, confront, and accept the challenge of reforming health care, of rethinking health care, of daring to be innovative, in a place that we think we understand, we think we know, you're farther ahead in thinking about how to improve America's democracy than anyone on Capitol Hill. Um, the, the Transform Conference is my third one. You come here to uh, uh, Rochester, Minnesota, which is kind of the elsewhere of the world. Um, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere, um, at the crossroads of nowhere and really nowhere. Um, but you know that, those of you who live and work here and are a part of this community, you see in the mornings as people are going to work the, the badged culture of the male world right here in the downtown area. And then of course the community supports the infrastructure of Mayo and then there are ancillary businesses associated with healthcare, associated with supporting Mayo. And, and all of it enriches this community as ostensibly a place that is about healthcare, a culture of healthcare. People talk about the Mayo culture. I'm not here to endorse the Mayo culture. I'm not here to criticize the Mayo culture. But I have to say that in the communities that I've lived in, the culture was not so much healthcare. It might have been, you know, New Orleans culture, Chicago culture. Hey, I did a lot of that in Chicago. Um, I grew up uh, as a young person in Syracuse, New York, carrier air conditioners, air conditioner culture. It didn't stick. But there's something meaningful about culture devoted to healthcare. And as we said last night in our uh, opening remarks and discussion that led from that very inspiring talk about our responsibilities in healthcare as we see uh, the narrative of, of Alzheimer's unfolding in a family, and in this case, a family of uh, people who were coached on women's basketball at the University of Tennessee, all the way to T.R. Reed's discussion of health on the planet. Um, we have a lot of thinking about culture to do to really think about healthcare. And let's start with the picture that I had last night of Earth as seen from space. You can do this on your computer, Google Earth. Um, it basically allows you to, to blow, you know, to, to fly into the Earth from, uh, uh, from space, seeing uh, the planet, and you can, you can focus almost directly in on uh, Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, Ruthie, do we have that shot, the Google Earth shot that we did last night in a very different context, but I want to show it here because it really says something about what happens to the world as you get down to the community level. We don't, if we don't have the shot, it'll probably come in a moment, but it's a, it's a set of slides that basically shows Earth from space, which again, you can do on your laptop. And as you get in closer, you begin to differentiate by country, by landmass, continent, geography, then country, then state, and then city. And in each case, each community has a different orientation to healthcare. It might be a political orientation. It might be the presence of infrastructure like the Mayo Clinic. Here we go. 
And we can talk about the health of our planet in raw statistics. We can talk about the health of our country in raw statistics. And you have a little politics there. You, you talk about the health of people in Minnesota. And of course, it's all about uh, corn and being in the choir. Um, those are the two main components of why people in Minnesota are healthy. Um, they all sing. And then you get to Rochester, Minnesota. And of course, on the skyline of Rochester, Minnesota is the Mayo Clinic. But as we get into our individual communities, then the notion of healthcare begins to differentiate. And then we really are talking about the culture of different communities. We're talking about communities who have a very different awareness about healthcare. And if you, if you hang out in Rochester, and I'm you know, man with a spinal cord injury for 37 years, I've been a member of very many healthcare communities in my life. Um, the rehab healthcare community, um, which is kind of a, fraternity slash NCAA competition to figure out how late you're going to stay up and fool the nurses. Um, and then, of course, it's all about recovering, returning to life. It's not an acute care community of healthcare. It is this curious mixture of acute care insofar as you're, con you're learning about your spinal cord, but you're also learning about what it's going to be like out there on the outside in a wheelchair or using some sort of prosthetic device. Uh, and in communities all over the United States, because of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, there are people going from these rehab communities back into their own communities. Now, if you spend time here in Rochester, and I have as a man in a wheelchair, I mean, you sort of get used to the fact that you're sitting at a restaurant, somebody's phone rings, and they'll start talking about lab reports. Um, because so many people are here in Rochester because they have a friend or loved one uh, who is being treated at Mayo. I get concerned a little bit because uh, if I show up in a wheelchair at Mayo, you know, I, I arrive at uh, Minneapolis Airport, where are you headed? Rochester, Minnesota, oh, Mayo, huh? I said, well, yeah, but I, I mean, I'm, it's not nothing big. You know, I tell my family, I, uh, I'm, where are you going, Daddy? I said, I'm going to the Mayo Clinic. Oh, is everything okay, Dad? I said, well, yeah, everything's perfectly fine. It's this great community of people who are, yeah, that's right, Dad. You can tell us. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong here. You hang out at the hotel, and, uh, you know, you, you order that first drink. How's everything going? Great. Of course, the staff of all the institutions here, including the hotels at, at, uh, in Rochester, are really hip to what's going on. But if you're sitting next to someone, you know, maybe you order that second drink. They go, things aren't going so well, huh? Did you get some bad results today? No, no, I'm perfectly fine. And of course, everybody is perfectly fine. But when we think about communities of health, we get drawn into narratives of sickness, narratives of malady, narratives of what's wrong, rather than a mobilization of a collective understanding of what's right, what's going on. Now, of course, somebody who always talks about, you know, there's some doctors in the audience. I've got this, like, right here. Could, is there, like, dermatologists, could you just come up here? For, I mean, a lot of this goes on here in Rochester. And, of course, if you are a practicing uh, medical doctor, you, you often, you know the question, you know, at Thanksgiving when you're with the friends, you know, someone gets you in a corner and says, you know, I have this, and you start to run for the door because it means you're doing some impromptu diagnosis around the cranberry sauce. Um, and people who obsess about you know, the little thing right here, I really wish someone would look at, uh, we call them hypochondriacs. And there's something supposedly like neurotic about such a person who's constantly thinking about what's wrong. Well, they are constantly thinking about what's wrong, but on some level they are constantly thinking about their health. They're sort of the, on the other side of the coin, there's the uh, hypochondriac, and then there, of course there's the person who's you know, carrying a stopwatch everywhere, is constantly monitoring their heart and going, heart rate below six, nice, <laughs> excellent. You know, testing like their, their, their uh, you know, O2 uptake in their blood you know, before lunch. Oh man, that's as good as Frank Shorter's, so I could run a marathon today. You know, people obsessed with the details, the statistics of their health. You know, they're viewed as a little eccentric, a little strange. Hypochondriacs. Don't want to get trapped on a plane with a hypochondriac. How's it going today? It's a long flight. Really long flight. Because you're going to hear about everything. 
But what if, instead of hypochondriac individuals or health-obsessed individuals that maybe make us feel a little nervous, we could have communities that are hypochondriacs, whole cities that are obsessed with the health of everybody, so that it's always a subject of conversation. How are you doing? You know, and people actually mean it. Have a nice day. Here's how, as opposed to have a nice day, not my business. I said have a nice day, see you later. I'm out of it, okay. You didn't have a nice day at this point, it's not my fault. What if, have a nice day, how are you doing, were serious questions about your neighbor's health, person down the block. What if we could have hypochondriac communities? And then as we pull away from Rochester and pull back into space, what if we could have hypochondriac countries? What if we could have a hypochondriac healthcare system that basically fuses a concern about health for everyone in the community with the technology and, and the means for saving lives? You know, they have this place in, in uh, Rochester called the Miracle Mile. They have a place in Chicago called the Miracle Mile. Two different miracles. Uh, one involves shoes, that's Chicago. The other involves all the things that happen that save lives here at uh, Mayo and in Rochester. And, and I'm, I'm struck, why do we call it miracle? Why are those miracles? Let's not ask the question, and you saw the images of the Towers of Light last night that are up at the 9-11 the site in New York and all the birds that are trapped in the light who get kind of caught in that intense beam and their migrating patterns are disrupted and there's actually a controversy in New York about whether those Towers of Light have too big of an impact on the birds and maybe we should, you know, turn them off and get away from this kind of 9-11 moment because it's having an impact on the birds. Um, that's for an ornithology conference, maybe not for Transform to discuss. But it is important to ask the question, you know, are we trapped in our myths and narratives about healthcare? Everyone who's saved, that's a miracle. What if that wasn't a miracle? What if that's just what we do? And believe me, I mean, if you go up to one of the doctors here, or the surgeons particularly, because they're the real hotshots in Rochester, but if you go up to a surgeon in, 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 in uh, Rochester and say, so you work on the Miracle Mile, how many miracles have you pulled off this week? You know, they won't know what you're talking about. They'll actually be a little bit insulted, and they will make a point to you, and this is not to extol surgeons. My God, they don't need any more self-esteem, do they? Whew. Hey, some for the rest of us, maybe, guys, please, a little bit, just leave it there next to the rubber gloves. We'll pick it up. Um, but seriously, they'll say, this is what we do. This is just what we do. It's not miracles. Saving lives is not dodging fate. Saving lives is not some casino roll and jackpot of circumstance, no. This is what we do in a community. I dream of a hypochondriac community that defines the health of each individual as the health of everyone around them and a system that can support such an idea. I want to read you something. This book, I recommend it. It's great. It tells you a little bit about why there's a Mayo Clinic here. It's one of these, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit like, um, St. Elsewhere meets the Book of Mormon. You know, it's, it's kind of, they were wandering across the country, stopped here. Somebody said, I'm not going any further. You know, it, yeah, it's, it's an American story, classic American story. Mayo Clinic is here as a result. There's a lot more details. There's a lot of he people here who can actually fill you in on the details. But um, here's, here's a problem that even the Mayo Clinic had, and it comes, it seems, straight out of the uh, congressional hearings over the Affordable Care Act a lot of that will be talked about here, whether uh, that policy decision relates to community health. But listen to this. The townspeople, the authors write, began to show a tendency to use St. Mary's, St. Mary's, of course, the big uh, original hospital here in uh, Rochester, 
began to show a tendency to use St. Mary's as a pest house upon which to dump the heavy and dangerous care of infectious diseases. And gradually, some of the Rochester doctors began to use the hospital facilities for their patients. Unfortunately, they still seemed to regard the hospital as a last resort and so failed to recommend hospitalization until the patient was at death's door. They probably did not aim to transfer the death from their own records to that of the hospital, which was duly recorded, but in effect, that was what they were doing. The mortality rate of St. Mary's Hospital began to rise, and the managers, in alarm, decided to take upon a bold step. They ruled that no patient should be admitted to the hospital until he or she had been examined by one of the doctors, Mayo. Now, you want to take a guess as to what year they're talking about here? It's 1889. 1889, we're still working on the primary care physician as entry point to the healthcare system problem. And here in Rochester, they've solved it a couple of times and had it go back to the way it was. And of course, in the original text, it wasn't the managers who made this decision. In 1889, it was the sisters who made the decision. I changed that on my own. And of course, I said, no patient should be admitted to the hospital until he or she had been examined by one of the doctors Mayo in the original text until he had been examined by one of the doctors Mayo. Sometime between 1889 and today, actual female patients came into existence at some point. Maybe at a future conference we could talk about that milestone year in human history. So, communities of culture, a culture of healthcare, a transformative community convened here in this room to confront the challenges of culture and politics and policy and business that all form the pieces of the healthcare challenge. If we can do this, we can do anything. Congratulations to all of you for being here. Thank you so much. I'm John Hockenberry. I'm a journalist. I know nothing about all of this, but I'm thrilled to have conversations with any of you and all of you about this. We have great, great content lined up for you today. Maria Bartiromo will be here to uh, really take a, a, a very high level look at the business model in healthcare delivery and providers. Uh, uh, Pete Nix will be uh, screening his movie, uh, the, the Waiting Room, later tonight. He will also be here to present a very patient-centric view of what's going on. Uh, uh, Dr. Eric Mannheimer is here, a dear friend of mine who wrote a remarkable book that you're going to be hearing about a little bit later. Um, and as always, the forum is open. Um, as you leave the sessions, please go to the forum. My colleague, uh, Allison Mitchell, will be there uh, convening the forum and making sure that the conversations that you have are productive and represent the sort of transform idea in that you're really talking about something you maybe never have talked about before, framed in a way you've never heard before, with someone you would never have met in any other context, and you take away a seed for thinking about healthcare in a fundamentally different way. Collect as many conversations as you can, and speaking of collections, before we begin, these are the various Mayo Clinic color-coded bands here. If you look in your uh, materials, they will show you sort of who does what. Blue is for speakers. Black is for attendees. Green is media. And the various colors are uh, Center for Innovation staff, who we want uh, to uh, have stand. The uh, putting together of this conference is an extraordinary effort that requires huge collaborative energy, the commitment of the Center for Innovation here and all of its terrific designers and healthcare, uh, I, I like to think of as Renaissance characters, really work year round to put this together. Members of the Center for Innovation, stand up. <laughs> mm. 
And now that I've identified them and outed them, if you have any question of any kind, please go to them. Please detain them, bother them. Um, you know, they are here to answer your questions about anything, anything in the Rochester area and anything about the conference. Let's thank all the sponsors. The reason the sponsors are here is because of their commitment to this idea that we need to confront change, that we need to think differently about change.